All right, guys, happy Friday. You made it to the end of the week. And on this Friday, I am going to make a call to action. Can we bring back racist humor? How to name your Asian baby. King song ding dong. That is objectively hilarious. It really just makes me so nostalgic for the 90s when we were all able to laugh at ourselves. What happened? Plus, later on in the show, you're not going to believe this, but there is a man who got five women pregnant at the exact same time. Even more stunning is the fact that they're celebrating together. Yep, they're doing a joint baby shower. All that and more today coming up on Candace Owens. that I'm a racist. No, but I definitely do prefer Asians. I've made that clear across this show. They seem to be the only ones that are not taking themselves too seriously. And I got to thinking after I saw that TikTok clip and I laughed way too hard at it and I just kept laughing at it, how much I actually miss the world. I miss the America that used to be able to to laugh at all of our differences. When you could see a comedian and they would be making fun of black people, white people, Asians, Jewish people, and we were all better for it in the end. Something changed, and I wondered to myself, when did it significantly change? Because like many other things in our society, it seemed to happen slowly and then very quickly. And now everybody is just, oh, you can't say that, it's so offensive. Oh, it's a trope, you can't say that about this group, you can't say that about that group. And I'm still wondering why not? Because it's obviously that it's pretty obvious that we all have differences and it makes it better when we can point them out. And I think actually it makes us closer. So I started thinking about what happened in terms of women not being able to laugh at themselves. And I guess obviously I was born in 1989 and I very much remember this moment. You might not. So I'm going to bring you back to 2013, the Golden Globes, when two actresses that I've always loved for their sense of humor, Tina Fey and Amy Poehler were hosting and they made fun of Taylor Swift. She had recently gotten out of another relationship, as she tends to do. She was dating Connor Kennedy. It lasted a couple of weeks, as it always does seem to tend to last. Not very long. I might be being a little hyperbolic there by saying it was a couple of weeks. And they just took a little friendly jab at her. Take a listen. You know what, Taylor Swift? You stay away from Michael J. Fox's son. Or go for it. No, you. she needs some me time to learn about herself. So what you can't see in that clip is that the audience found the joke to be very funny. Everyone in the audience found the joke to be funny, except for Taylor Swift. She took it very seriously. She felt that they had somehow personally injured her. And when she went on to do a big, great interview in Vanity Fair that same year, she said this about the moment. She said, for a female to write about her feelings and then be portrayed as some clingy, insane, desperate girlfriend in need of making you marry her and have kids with her, I think that's taking something that potentially should be celebrated, a woman writing about her feelings in a confessional way. That's taking it and turning it and twisting it into something that is frankly a little sexist. Frankly, a little sexist, the rise of the ism culture. How can I be offended as a woman? How can I be offended as a person of color? How can I be offended as a Jewish individual? A Jewish individual, like a, a thousand times we're seeing this all across the board. And I think this was largely due, particularly as it pertains to women, to the rise of modern feminism. Taylor Swift notoriously said that Lena Dunham, that young woman who's always naked on Instagram, taught her how to be a feminist and made her understand, I guess, that she should be taking herself very seriously. And she's really kept up that can't laugh at myself thing for a very long time. Recently, you guys may have caught this, it was circulating. Taylor Swift was very upset, again, at the 2024 Golden Globes this time, when Joe Coy, who was the comedian that was hosting, made another like I said, light joke her way. He tossed it her way. Really, the joke was at the expense of the NFL constantly focusing on her newest relationship with Travis Kelsey. But let's hear what Joe Coy said that got her so upset. As you know, we came on after a football doubleheader. Uh, the big difference between the Golden Globes and the NFL, on the Golden Globes, we have fewer camera shots of Taylor Swift. I swear, there's just more to go to here. I mean, I'm asking you seriously. I know that so many people that follow me, you guys are Taylor Swift stands. I get it. People love her all across the world. 
But was it that serious? Couldn't you just muster a giggle, a smile? Is it really necessary to do just this very serious face to let him know that it's not funny and that you are a feminist and it's not funny to talk about somebody's relationship? And again, I'd like to point out that he's making a joke at the expense of the NFL, not really at Taylor Swift. They are the ones that are obsessed with her relationship and constantly panning shots to her every reaction. So really what she's what she's doing here is she is the model for woke culture and it is woke culture that kills comedy. There, there's no question about it. Everybody is so easily offended. And it makes me really miss, as I said earlier, the 90s. I grew up when comedy was really at its peak. I think it was in 1999 when Chris Rock did his Bigger and Blacker. And I remember, obviously, I was quite young. I was born in 89. I was just 10 years old. But how much laughter it produced in my household. And that laughter was being produced by the ability for no group to really take themselves that seriously. You forget what it's like when a comedian has the nerve to stand up and laugh at you for our very obvious cultural differences. America is a melting pot. There are so many different groups of people here. And yes, within those specific groups, our cultures are different. Don't let the media convince you of something else or that it's wrong or that it's backwards. We're just different people. So what's basically happened now that everybody is taking themselves way too seriously is that we are producing an incredibly unfunny comedian. Like it, everybody's just not funny. Woke comedians are simply not funny. I saw this clip circulating on Twitter and I just couldn't even believe it. It's, it's actually quite embarrassing, really. But the job now of a comedian is to try to write jokes that aren't going to offend anybody. I can't tell you the name of this young woman, unfortunately, but let me know whether or not you find this to be something to laugh at. Take a listen. I discovered recently that I feel the same way about men that I do about spiders, which is like, I get it. You're good for the ecosystem. You got a lot of great qualities, but every time I see one in a room and I'm not expecting it, I'm just like, okay, but are you chill? Or are you going to be one of the ones that kills me? Ha, 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 ha. That's it for you guys. That's woke humor nowadays. Don't you get it? It's really funny. She sees a spider in the room and it reminds her of when she sees men in a room and she's like, are you a chill spider? Are you like a chill man? Because men are so scary. That's also part of the feminist brand of humor. You can always make jokes at the expense of men. It's just that the jokes, they're just not funny. That's the truth. That's the reality. Woke humor simply is not funny. You know who is funny? Uh, Bill Burr and all the comedians who are not invited, they are sort of persona non gratas in Hollywood. They are definitely not invited anymore to host the awards because they're too offensive. And Bill Burr is one such comedian. I've always enjoyed him uh, simply because of his life circumstances and the way that he mocks them. If you're not familiar with him, he is a man. He's got reddish sort of hair and he's married to a black woman, right? So right there you have differences that can be mocked. I've seen Bill Burr live twice now and he's absolutely hilarious. Again, it's for his his ability to simply mock himself and also to mock his wife and mock the differences and the things that you learn when you're in an interracial relationship. And here is one such clip where he is making racist jokes and they're landing well. Take a listen. Do you know why so many Caucasians need facelifts? Because we don't know about lotion. I didn't know anything about lotion. Never used it the first 33 years of my life. Never used it. To one night I was going out with this black girl, right? She was getting ready and she was just putting that on everywhere, just slathering it on. I thought she had like a rash or something. White people totally missed the lotion seminar at some point in history. We missed that the way black people missed the whole register your weapons summit. Right? The amount of rappers who've been busted for the unregistered Glock in the car just blows my mind. No, it breaks my heart every time I see it. I just think, God, if he just had one white friend, he just had one white friend in his entourage. The dude would have been sitting there going like, is that thing registered? You out of your mind? Dude, get it out of there. Get it out of there. Yeah, it's illegal. That's like three to five mandatory. I know you're laughing. I know you're laughing because that's objectively funny and it's objectively true. It actually happens in my marriage. Me and my husband constantly make jokes at each other. That's why I say, I'm definitely racist. I'm constantly saying, oh, that's because you're white. He wants me to try to do the cold dip in the morning. My husband likes to get in freezing cold water in the morning. And I explained to him, I simply will not be participating in that because I'm not white. Obviously, I'm black and I'm 
under no circumstances going to submerge myself into ice, even though he says it makes the senses come alive and he makes fun of me for things that he says are ridiculously black. We laugh at each other. Uh, that is what is missing in this society. That is why people are fundamentally not happy because we are taking ourselves way too seriously. So again, my call to action, please, America, everywhere, everywhere in the world, not just America, can we please bring back racist humor? That's all I'm gonna ask for today. Balance of Nature fruits and veggies are a great way to make sure that you're getting essential nutritional ingredients every single day. Balance of Nature uses an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and vegetables into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing that's in Balance of Nature's fruit and veggie capsules are, well, fruits and vegetables. Right now, not only will my listeners get 35% off your first order, you'll now get a free fiber and spice supplement as well. Balance of Nature's Fiber and Spice Supplement is a revolutionary fiber drink with a unique blend of 12 spices and whole foods. There has never been an easier way to make sure that you're getting your daily dose of fruits and vegetables. Experience Balance of Nature for yourself today. Go to balanceofnature.com and use promo code Candice for 35% off your first order as a preferred customer, plus get a free bottle of Fiber and Spice. That's balanceofnature.com, promo code Candice for 35% off your first preferred order, plus a free bottle of fiber and spice. All right, guys, now it's time for some topics du jour. All right, first up on the topic of Taylor Swift. And like I said, I know that you guys are major Taylor Swift stands. I don't mind it. I actually think um, that there are tons of things to love about her. I've said that on the show before. I, I love that she keeps her image squeaky clean. I love that Taylor Swift has, you know, never promoted um, overt sexuality or the culture of pornography that I speak against and that she kind of keeps young women in this sort of dreamy, dopey state. You know, it's very middle school. And I think that overall, that's a good thing. But what I am always concerned about is that there does seem to be this like cultural mesmerization when it comes to Taylor Swift. And what's important about that is that those icons have changed over time. I would say that it used to be Beyonce, where it was like, whatever Beyonce says, she's a queen. I stand Beyonce. You can say no bad words about Beyonce or the beehive is going to come for you. And what I think inevitably happens when someone gains that much power is that suddenly politicians start paying attention to that power and Hollywood, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, pop culture, what you're talking about, that word cult, it, it does create a cult mentality. And people don't think twice. Whatever that person says does become for them, unfortunately, like an order from God. And when politicians get involved, I'll, uh, I'm thinking, of course, notoriously of Beyonce the night before Hillary Clinton, and we were supposed to go to the, the polls. Hillary Clinton had her on stage in 2016, and she's basically like, I'm with her. And everyone's like, oh, I must be with her as well, simply because it's Beyonce. That's not a a valid reason to vote for somebody. So what I'm saying essentially about Taylor Swift is that she has become that new icon and politicians are paying attention to the power that she has. And I don't think it's by accident that even if you're not a Taylor Swift fan, I certainly am not a fan of Taylor Swift, even though I like some of her old songs, you just open any app and they're just throwing you so much Taylor Swift content all the time. You can't avoid her. Why is that? It's like a psychological conditioning that's taking place on social media. Well, listen to this. Recently, the EU commissioner, vice president, uh, went on stage and basically said, we need to use Taylor Swift to mobilize young voters. Take a listen. Taylor Swift, uh, last uh, September, she made a social media call to young Americans to register to vote. The day after her post, 35,000 young Americans had registered to vote. Now, Taylor Swift will be in Europe in May. 9th of May, Europe Day, she will be in Paris for a concert. So uh, I would very much hope that she does the same for young Europeans, and I very much hope that someone from her media team follows this press conference 
and relay our request. To give you some context, that is the vice president of the European Commission. His name is Margaritas Shanas. And basically the reason why they're looking at Taylor Swift is that if you're not paying attention to global politics, the EU is losing a lot of power. Um, people are starting to say, wait, why do we have this government within a government? Why do we have to listen to a bunch of unelected bureaucrats? This is really what happened with Brexit. This is the reason that the UK left the European Union. You might remember that taking place in 2016. Well, now other countries in the European Union are going, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that either. And so their idea is how can we get people to support us? How can we get people to still want there to be a European commission and a European union? And then looking at Taylor Swift. Now she's done nothing wrong. She hasn't reached out to them and said, can I help? I don't think she's particularly interested in European politics, but it's something that I just want to make you aware of. And what I'm constantly talking about on the show is the power of Hollywood. And when that begins to conflate with politics, uh, another notorious example of that was when Joe Biden, who clearly does not listen to Cardi B music, when he was running for uh, president and he was doing no events because of COVID and yet he made time to sit down with Cardi B. What was the message that he was sending. Well, I don't have to actually talk to you about my ideas or sell you why I think that I would necessarily be a good president. I just know that 40 million of you guys are following this young woman on Instagram and you're hanging on her every word. That starts to get dangerous. So if you are a mother listening to the show and you have a daughter who loves Taylor Swift, you do need to be able to speak to your, your children, your teenagers, uh, your young adults about separating a public persona from real life. You know what I mean? Uh, making sure that appreciating somebody's music or loving somebody as an artist doesn't translate into something uh, worse, like a form of idolatry, which is basically casting a spell on people and listening to somebody's every word when you shouldn't be because your life and how you live it should not be impacted by the politics of a celebrity. All right, guys, moving on, already having an update on a story that I didn't expect. So early on this week, we covered DEI initiatives and how dangerous they were getting, especially when it comes to the airlines and what happened last week when a door just flew off its hinges midair during United flight. We showed you a clip of the CEO, Scott Kirby, talking about how we want more people of color. We want you know, the entire DEI pitch. This is what we care about now. And it really calls into question how safe it is to fly anymore uh, when these are the initiatives. Well, crazy update to that story. And I promise you, this is real. At the time when I was looking at him speak, I just thought this is a straight white male. Uh, no, I don't know what to do other than to show you the clip of Scott Kirby dancing in drag. This is the CEO of United. He is also moonlighting as a drag queen. Take a listen. <laughs> Yeah, so I got to be very careful in what I say here, obviously, because of YouTube policies and not being allowed to say the truth so much anymore. Um, here's what I will will say. Times are different, man. This sort of content, if some your boss Googled you and saw that you were moonlighting as a drag queen, dressing up like that, that would be something that would probably disqualify you for the position of CEO, CEO anywhere in the world. And I've covered this in, in past episodes saying that now they don't say that this is problematic. Obviously, uh, notoriously, we know what just recently happened in Congress. We know what recently happened in the White House when that gentleman, Sam Brinton, again, just to jog your memory, there were photos on the internet predating his hiring at the White House. He was very open about the fact that he enjoyed this sexual kink of pup play. In fact, he taught seminars in this photo that you're looking at. This is him standing above three adult men. They're wearing puppy masks. They've got chains. They're on all four. We covered this in the past. This, this sexual kink, proud of it. He was absolutely proud of it. He still got the job. And I just want you to think about that. Uh, when people that moonlight as dogs, as drag queens, uh, are open about their sexual fetishes, are now being put into positions of power, whether that is, again, like Scott Kirby as the CEO of United, or if it's like Sam Brinton and he is in charge of nuclear energy at the White House. 
What does that spell for our society? Is, do you really believe that you can just completely separate your persona, your whatever you're moonlighting as, from your job? Well, I can say for a fact that the answer when it came to Sam Brinton was no. Obviously, the reason that he got let go from his position was because he was stealing um, women's suitcases, several women's suitcases from the airport, and he got caught and he got arrested multiple times for this. So no, he was not able to separate um, his real life from his moonlighting persona. It remains to be seen whether or not Scott Kirby can. This to me is incredibly disturbing. It's disturbing to me that we keep reporting on this, the incidents of people that are working as kindergarten teachers, that are working within the school system, that are also moonlighting uh, uh, as drag queens. I, I find it to be extremely problematic. And I think that is the strongest possible terms that I can say, again, due to new YouTube policies and new social media policies where you can't talk about these issues in a practical way. All right, guys, moving on. So I kind of rang the alarm last year on what I guess you can only say is the explosion of polyamory. It was a particular case that I found to be very interesting out of New York C City, where essentially they were asking the judge to recognize polyamorous unions. It was a thruple, three men, and they wanted that forget gay marriage. Now we want to say that we want to be a thruple, which calls into question whether or not the decision to acknowledge gay marriage was in fact a slippery slope for society. I would make the argument that yes, it has represented a slippery slope, that things have very quickly gotten, taken a dark turn in American society. Well, here now seems to be the media trying to promote polyamory across the board. Uh, first and foremost, this is a headline, uh, New York Magazine. You can see it features four kittens snugly, and it says, Polyamory, a practical guide for the curious couple. This is another headline coming from USA Today. It says, Swingers want you to know a secret. Swinging is not just about sex. Here is another headline from the New York Times. How a polyamorous mom had a big sexual adventure and found herself. Now, again, I was seeing this happen last year, and it's very, I think, telling when it is starting to move across the court system because uh, New York City did side in favor in that particular case that I was just alleging to, uh, alluding to, pardon, they did side in favor of the polyamorous union. They, they recognized this throuple. But if you need even more proof that getting rid of a normal relationship, right? Forget marriage being between a man and woman or relationship being between a man and a woman and now invite everybody into your relationship. This is a real story coming out of New York, a uh, New York City musician. His name is Zeddy Will. He is 22 years old. He recently hosted a joint baby shower for his five pregnant baby mamas. Just take a look at these pictures. These baby mamas, five of them all embracing each other. One of them, Ashley, 29, revealed the startling achievement by showing off the party invitations. She was so proud of this. She's like, yes, this is okay. I am very excited about this. This is Nick Cannon culture. Um, I, I'm excited to be sister wives. Actually, these aren't even sister wives. I think we could call this sister baby mamas because he's not married to any of them. And yeah, she she revealed the joint invitation. It says, welcome little Zeddy Wills one through five. Yeah, because there's five little Zeddy Wills. They're all pregnant at the exact same time. They look remarkably happy in these untraditional family photos, posing outside of their, uh, posing at their party, holding their bellies, something that should be so sacred, the beginning of a family. And they are celebrating this in just a really crass way. Ashley revealed that they've all learned to just accept one another, all of the baby mamas, because they believe that it's going to be better for the children. It's going to be better for the children. I, you know, I call me crazy. Call me old fashioned. Call me traditional. I know, Candace, you're you're a Puritan. I get that sometimes. You are just becoming puritanical. Yeah, I, I like being a Puritan. I do not take that as an insult, but call me crazy. I personally think the best circumstance for those children would have been to have one father and one mother and to grow up in a stable household, not in a household where the father has to divide his time across five different households, um, where he has to divide his time during the holidays, when he has to divide his time uh, 
on their birthdays, whatever it is, I think that that would be, that would represent a more stable household. But again, like I said, in my personal opinion, we have seen a radical shift in the idea of what is a stable household. We have seen this push to almost make the traditional family dirty, right? Like the nuclear family unit, we've seen this not just in the school system, but culturally a shifting away from that. This uh, feminist manifesto of I can do bad all by myself, I don't need a man, and now we have this new dawn that is upon us where we're saying, okay, I do maybe need a man just to have a child, but I'm happy to share him with five other women. Now, I'm going to guess that this as happy as they all look in these photos, is not going to be as glamorous as they're trying to sell it. I am going to make a wild guess that these women are not going to be happy when they realize what it actually takes to raise a child, that it does take two stable adults and the commitment that you want from your husband, or I guess in this circumstance, your, your baby daddy. But again, what do I know? I'm old fashioned. Now let's jump into some politics, a moment that I think should not have happened. Here's the thing. I've been very open to the fact that I will be supporting Trump in this election cycle now that he is the Republican nominee. I've been very open about the fact that I like Vivek Ramaswamy. I hope he picks him for his VP because I think Vivek has a very deep understanding of the ideas. But there is something that is making me nervous about what I am seeing happening in Trump camp right now. So obviously, Trump did lose some support since the 2020 election cycle. Despite the fact that he is blowing the other candidates out of the water, I would say that some of his supporters drifted into the DeSantis camp. And the reason why the DeSantis camp was not able um, to do as well as they had expected was largely because of an online orbit of influencers, which were quite nasty towards Trump supporters. Honestly, what I got from them was that they felt that Trump supporters were all deplorable. It felt very Hillary Clinton 2.0 not saying anything about, I didn't really get this from necessarily DeSantis himself, but definitely from some people that were in his office, people that were putting gators in their profile. Uh, Christina Pushaw definitely uh, getting the sense that they were blaming all Trump supporters if one Trump supporter said something bad. This is how they all think, you know, just kind of castigating all of them. And it obviously did not work long-term for DeSantis because he needed to gain Trump supporters. Well, I'm seeing the same thing now happen in Trump camp where they're basically saying there have been a ton of people that support DeSantis that are saying, okay, now it's time to get behind Trump as the nominee. And they're going, no, we don't want you. We don't want you. Forget you because you didn't support Trump the entire time. Guys, not an effective election strategy. Here's the thing. To win elections, you need votes. So it wasn't an effective strategy for people who were supporting DeSantis to push away Trump supporters. It is not going to be an effective strategy for Trump supporters to push away DeSantis supporters. You don't want them to go, okay, I, I hate Trump supporters so much that I am now going to vote for Nikki Haley or I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. And I saw this clip. It's a clip of Congressman Matt Gates. He's great on a lot of things, but he was not so great here on Newsmax talking to Carl Higby. This is a moment that, again, the Trump campaign should just say, ah, this is not what we're going to be saying in the future. Take a listen. What I could tell you is like, for every Karen we lose, there's a there's a Julio and a Jamal ready to sign up for the MAGA movement, and that abodes well for our ability to be more diverse. What? For every Karen that we lose, there's going to be a Julio and a Jamal that we pick up. So, so the message that you want to send is, well, we don't care if we're losing support amongst white people, uh, white women. We're just going to go after, you know, the black and the Spanish vote. Not good, especially because Karen is in without question a racial pejorative that is being used against white women. What do you, you don't want to reject people at all. You don't want to use these sort of racial pejoratives against white people, black people, or Hispanic people. And to just simply say, we don't care about that vote anymore. Well, you're starting to sound like leftists. You're starting to sound, again, like the kind of things that we would hear out of Hillary Clinton's camp, where you're starting to castigate an entire group of people. It's just not going to work long term. And I think if you ask me whether or not I felt in this moment that Trump was gaining voters, now, despite the fact, like I said, he's he in terms of being a Republican nominee, he's got tons of votes, he's blowing the other candidates in the water. But the question about whether or not he's gain, gaining support since 2020 I'm not so sure. And I think they need to stop in the same way that I said, if the Santa's camp wanted to win votes, they needed to stop and they needed to assess themselves and they didn't do that. I think the Trump campaign is going to need to stop and to assess and to say, how do we earn votes? 
This is not the way. Now, to be clear, Matt Gates is not a member of the Trump campaign, but I'm, I'm calling this out because this is not going to be the way, right? You're only going to win votes with a vision for the future that makes people feel like they can trust and like they can respect you. You're also only going to gain votes through hard work ethic. Um, I still think that Vivek Ramaswamy ran the most effective campaign of all the candidates. He went from a person that was completely unknown to being able to get 8% of the Republican vote in Iowa. That is a remarkable success story. And I do think that what needs to be adopted is his strategy. If, if you want to win, you got to run a campaign like Vivek did. Uh, he just completely worked his butt off. He didn't really resort to slinging any mud. And he wanted every single vote, every Ken, every Karen, every Julio, every Jamal. So that's all I want to say about that clip. All right, guys. Now, before we get into some of your comments, I want to make sure that you're having the best weekend ever. And I thought, what better way to jump into the weekend than with another Megan Fox poem? You guys loved when I was reading Megan Fox. It's a wonderful book. It's, it's there deep. She's, she's Robert Frost, basically. This one is entitled Manic Depressive Peter Pan. But how will you ever know if I'm smiling when you can't see past your own tears? That's it. That's the end of the poem. All right, guys, now let's jump into some of your comments regarding episodes past. First set of comments are pertaining to the airport brawl, another airport brawl, because that's just America's ghetto now. It's just, it's just what happens. There are things you should expect to see at an airport, and that took place in Atlanta, allegedly over espresso shots, according to the employees. Rod asks the question that's on everybody's mind. What about espresso shots? I have so many questions. Did she put too many espresso shots in the drink? Did she put too little? Did she wait until the espresso shot got cold before she put it in a drink? Did she spill an espresso shot? Did she throw an espresso shot at the other woman's face? Shot glass and all. I mean, depending on the situation, like the last, I can see her maybe wanting to fight. I don't know. Yes, I asked you guys, give me the context where that sort of reaction makes sense, where you just start wanting to beat up all the employees. And I, I can't imagine. Yeah, maybe if someone took a steaming hot espresso shot and threw it into my face. But I still don't think that I would be bucking up and trying to like fight men. I don't know. I don't know. I guess we all have a human reaction. But nope, no one said that an espresso shot was thrown in the police report, just that the fight was over espresso shots. So... Yeah, that is just the way it goes. Michelle writes, I can't help but thinking the girl in the coffee shop might have just walked away if they'd just let her have her coat. They wanted her to go, but she wanted her coat. Maybe it was cold outside. Maybe her keys were in her coat. Don't get me wrong. She could have walked away and called the police for assistance, but instead she chose to fight. Yeah, there were some people saying, also she was slammed. This is wrong. All of this stuff. Here's the thing. this We, we shouldn't make excuses for people behaving like animals. We are just starting to see more of an animalistic impulse in people. And that's why I correlate it to toddler behavior. It's almost like people have become so ignorant that they that they land on that aggressiveness because they don't know how to communicate with words. And this is another circumstance where there is entirely, obviously, no reason that a an argument over espresso shots should have landed in violence, especially in a public place, especially when that public place is an airport where there's already this heightened sense of, am I secure? So the entire situation is unfortunate. And I think, again, just telling about the times that we live in. Now, jumping into some of your comments pertaining to Ballerina Farm, also known as Hannah Nealman on Instagram. Super wholesome life. People are upset because she's just jumping back into her life and she looks too glamorous, uh, getting ready for another beauty pageant. How? That's so unfair that you just gave birth in your bed, the internet says. And then now you are setting unex uh, unrealistic expectations for women. How dare you my take, this is jealousy, this is insecurity. Salem writes, I have six kids. When you get to that many kids, you have to just jump back in if you have any ability to do so. And she probably feels great, good for her. She eats healthy, she's fit, but she is also real. I want her postpartum experience to be more common. It's no shame on anyone who doesn't get it, but I hope for it myself. I've mostly had a rough time postpartum, but it doesn't have to be hard. It's funny that you uh, uh, say that you have six kids and that it really is what has to happen. You do have to jump back into it because, oh yeah, you've got a bunch of other children. That is so true. I have found that it actually gets easier and easier the more children that you have, mainly because you know what to expect, but also because you're you're like, I have responsibilities and I think your mindset is different. And 
it, it just for me, I think the first pregnancy was the hardest because you didn't know what to expect or what you were doing too soon. But again, I think just having her as an example, because it seems to be the circumstance that when people are having miserable postpartum experiences, they constantly get attention online. Why can't someone get attention and showcase the the upside and, and the positive example of being postpartum? KWB writes, I had a 10.8 pound baby almost three years ago via C-section. My lower stomach still doesn't look right, even though I lost the baby weight and then some. Of course, you get jealous of people who seem to effortlessly bounce back, but I couldn't imagine being genuinely mad or offended by someone who had an easier time post-birth. Just say, good for her and move on with your day. Exactly. Be happy for happy people. I don't know why we always want people to be trauma dumping instead. And we go, oh, you're so real, girl. Thanks for crying on the internet. Thanks for talking about your depression. Uh, thanks for being miserable all the time. We, we've become so accustomed to it that when we see someone happy, we just go, oh, I want to destroy it. And I don't think that's good for humanity. Precious writes, the only reason why people are upset about her being able to go back to her life is jealousy. I think everyone should see it and feel inspired and not jealous. The fact that you aren't able to snap back fast does not mean that she should not be happy that she was able to. I agree with that. And I think that there has been an equal reaction now of people saying the exact same thing, people that are out there uh, defending her and defending her right to be a happy mother of eight who just likes to bake and cook and tend to the chickens and tend to the hogs and also occasionally do a beauty pageant where she talks about the beauty of motherhood. We love you, Ballerina Farm. Uh, we also love you, Megan Fox. Your poetry has inspired all of us for the weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time that we have for today. As a reminder, if you have not yet checked out my show, A Shot in the Dark, now is the time to binge and catch up. There are new episodes that are dropping every other Friday. Next week, we are going to be talking about the HIV vaccine. We'll see you on Monday for a brand new episode. 